Oh yes, right here in the middle. It's all right. You have to turn it on at the bottom. So, um, Huda, I was curious as to how many Latin fonts are there out there and how many Arabic, just roughly, and how many Arabic companions do they have? So how many lonely Latin fonts are there that need companions? <laughs> That's a very nice way. It's on. It's on? It's on? Okay. Uh, there's lots of lonely, poor Latin fonts out there. Now, I think, they're, they're, I think they, you can't count them anymore, actually. There's like mm, probably I would thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands. And in Arabic, I think you can say there's maybe hundreds now, um, and half of them you can throw away. So it's still a long way. Um, but what is interesting is I think now that a lot of, a lot of actually Western designers are interested in Arabic and are interested in developing Latin companions. So if you're interested in Arabic, you have a lot of work. There's only, um, in my opinion, something like five really good type designers, Arab type designers, and they can't cover thousands of texts. They can't do the work. Somebody has to help them. Someone else? Thank you. I'd like to ask uh, Dana Sajdi a, a question: uh, whether um, whether you have conducted any um, quantitative analysis of the production of texts and books in the period which you studied in the 18th century, particularly, uh, and uh, you, I mean, you transformed our understanding of how book, of the nature of book production, book writing at that period. But I'd like to know whether you, as I say, conducted any quantitative comparison with that and, I mean, you, you, um, you trace a sort of uh, theory of sort of evolution, don't you? I think I'm right in saying, between the, the chronicles of the 18th century and the press, the Arabic press of the 19th century. But have you any, have, can you produce any comparative figures as to the actual production? of uh, texts. I mean, how many copies of, uh, for instance, the, the Barber's books uh, were produced and, uh, and how many people read them as compared with the number of, uh, of newspapers that were produced in the ensuing period and how many people read those? Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, <laughs> I can't hear myself. Thank you for the question. And no, I have not and I cannot. <laughs> so what I, and actually all the six people that I mentioned in my uh, talk, the six chroniclers, they're all one or two copies maximum because they're, because they are not, you know, they're not well known in a particular discursive space, right? So it almost kind of makes the point, what is, uh, what I'm trying to say is that anybody could write one. Right. Whether it was received or not, they felt that they were legitimized in writing them. And that's actually the lack of copies makes a, 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 an even stronger case. If Either way, you can make a strong case about it. So if there were many copies, it's great. There are no copies, you can still make a case that they were actually um, a popular form, not because the audiences actually received them, because anybody thought that they could write one and could have an audience, even if they didn't, in the end. Is, is, is the logic making any sense? Yeah. yeah. But, yeah, yeah. The, well, it's a question of whether it's an evolution or revolution, really, between the 18th oh, century and the 19th century. That's what I'm driving at. Oh, I now, see. The, the re I mean, you've argued elsewhere that it was an evolution, yeah. and not a, not a revolution. I but see. nevertheless, uh, I think if you look at it in quantitative terms, yes. and that's quite important, it, socially speaking, it was a revolution, wasn't it? I think between the difference between manuscript production, even even our new understanding of the quantity of it, uh, and the print production of the nineteenth century. Um, uh, okay, so I think yes, of course, print production is something very different in the sense the quantity and the you know the quantity and the and the uh, uh, it just is not in, is, it cannot be com uh, compared to the scribal. Uh, culture. So I'm not making a, uh, 
I'm not trying to deny that there is a huge difference. But that's but what I have a problem with is actually calling it print culture as such, as though it's a completely different uh, way of being. Because I think the the reason that it was adopted at all was that there's a, a an inclination to actually taking on the form. So what I'm trying to say is just a little bit more. Uh, it's it's a little less abrupt than it has been uh, portrayed in the scholarship. That's it. So it's just a, 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 a bit of breaks on it. Um, as for the production of the 18th century, I mean, what I've noticed, and it's not comprehensive, but from looking at the different cat, you know, manuscript uh, catalogs all over, is that there is a huge, a, quite a, not a huge, a significant production in first person narratives all the way from Iraq to Morocco in the 18th century, not necessarily by people of um, various backgrounds, by ulama as well. So everything becomes much more personalized. And so that's the, the big difference that I can yes. talk about. Nelly Hannah found the same thing yeah, with yeah, Egypt, yeah. and she yeah. for the same period. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, it's a question actually again for uh, Dana Sajdi. Um, it's to do with the manuscript, uh, it's a library scene uh, from the Makamat of Al Hariri in your book. Just a very practical question. I was wondering why the books are laid flat and not vertically like in a lot of libraries that you, you see now. Thank you for the question. It's actually not from my book at all. And I want to throw the question at. <laughs> okay, I'm going to, I'd like to hold off because it's not for me, but it's going to be for Steve is going to talk, okay. talk about structure and what structure tells us about uh, how and books. She will answer the question. She will okay. answer the question. Right? Okay. Christine, you're going to. Okay, I'll be there. <laughs> Thank you. The other, uh, if I could just interject on this, uh, on um, Jeffrey's question a bit, that, you know, I, well, tomorrow I'm going to cite uh, some statistics and stuff, but uh, I know your, your books are in, uh, were produced in small quantities, one or two copies, or at least that's what we know that survived. That's what's but left I, of them, yeah. But I have evidence in, in the historical texts of the kind that Hugh was talking about. We know that there were hun 100 copies of a, of a single book were produced, and so, so that they, there was a, a, a real sense of publication. And I think that, these, that comp many, many copies exist existed of particular titles, particularly important ones, in a way that I, I'm, uh, that I think prefigured printing, that did it, so that I, I would agree that it was much more of a transition than a revolution. Mm -hmm. But that seems to have stopped conversation. <laughs> <laughs> no, come on. Hello. Oh, thank you. Um, thank, thank all of you for the uh, wonderful presentations. Um, uh, I, my question is on stylistic differences. And at the end, Huda ended by showing these different trends and different, um, these kind of competing avenues through which font developing is, um, if fonts are digital type are being developed, um, and also the variety of, of digital fonts. But stylistic differences has, have always been present. And in one sense, the papers, as diverse as they were, presented writing a little bit as a monolithic thing, that Arabic, the, this is Arabic script and Arabic was written. And so I, it's a, that's more of an open topic or open question for any of the presenters to comment on how stylistic differences played out at these different time periods in the different regions that you, that you studied and the way those differences also communicated things to audiences, to genres, um, to, to various communities outside of the the linguistic content of the text. Because the title of my paper was Birth of Arabic on Stone, then I was looking at a particular medium. Um, but we do have other media, and there's where you'll see much bigger stylistic differences. So for Nabataean um, texts, for example, we do actually have a number of papyri and that, that's where, as I, I said in my lecture, with soft media is where you can experiment much more mm -hmm. in style. 
and the papyri show that there's much you can be much more florid, for example. Um, but it it varies quite a lot across the peninsula. If you go down to Yemen, for example, to the South Arabian script, there's a an enormous variation between the royal inscriptions, normally talking about the exploits of the king set up on you know, colossal stones, sometimes you know, two or three meters high, and then in you know, really a lot of care and attention gone to making, it, it attracts your attention, it draws you in because it's both the scale and often the slightly involved style. Whereas if you get down to, in Yemen, you get a lot of inscriptions talking about the fact that it's my turn to have a go at the, um, have the canal gates open so as I can get my water for an hour or two a day, and then it's your go. So these are quite small inscriptions relating to just individual water usage. And these tend to be much more functional. It needs to be clear. It's just there for the record. It's almost legalistic in the sense that if someone starts cutting off the water early or trying to keep their bit of water longer, the other person can sue you. So it, it's got sort of a legal formulaic scent. And then actually in Yemen is the one place in Saudi Arabia where we have a good number of cursive texts on, they wrote on palm stalks for their documentary texts, just the kind of broader part of the beginning of a palm leaf, which they would dry and then use for writing. It's interesting, they would put a hole in it and then you could hang them up and kind of store them in rows and quite a few of these have come out of from temple archives. And then it's a highly cursive, um, very quite difficult to read, so it was probably specific you know, scribes who'd actually had training in it and that, so that becomes again a totally different style. So a, bi a big variation. We possibly would see that if we had documents surviving from pre-Islamic Arabic and more from Nabataean, but I'll <laughs> I don't know whether you want to <laughs> argue for or against that. <laughs> Um, we didn't show uh, any uh, larger image of the Dome of the Rock. Had we done so, you would have at least seen two uh, very, very different styles there, more, more or less contemporaneous. The Hijazi, which figures in all our, or at least in the mans old manuscript that I've showed, and then the more monumental uh, um, Kufi script that you find uh, 280 meters, I remember, yeah, the, the oldest, uh, the oldest Quranic text document dated, it is uh, dated, uh, it goes back to Abdul Malik in, in the inner, in the interior of the Dome of the Rock. I don't know, uh, this has been compared to um, to the Mayuscule script, how do, say, uh, say, uh, do you say that in English, Robert? Mayuscule, Mayuscule script in, in, uh, in Latin uh, inscriptions, because it's very really uh, much more monumental than the Hijazi script can be. Um, this uh, didn't appear, but one should keep it in mind, of course. Hmm. I just add to uh, a, a little bit here. I think that it's um, monumental writing is not just something that happens on stone and so on. You get monumental writing on paper and parchment. It's my impression, and, and I think I may be corrected here from Jonathan and other people, that the writing of Korans, for example, uh, was in many cases much more conservative in the use of script and so on than writing of, of, of other sorts of literature. There's much more tendency to keep using parchment, animal skins basically, because that's m much more durable and so on th than paper. But you also get examples like Fatimid royal decrees uh, from Egypt in the uh, late um, 10th and early into the 11th century are magnificent things but are very extravagant with the use of paper, very large hand, beautifully spaced across the, uh, the page and so on, and with those little curl ups at the end which remain common in, in royal documents right through the Ottoman period and, and so on. And we know about these Fatimid royal decrees because a surprising number of turn up reused in the Geniza because it's, it's this wonderful paper and there's lots of spaces so you can write all sorts of things in between these wonderful um, Fatimid letters. And so there are, diff there are different registers with, with handwriting uh, as well as in monumental script. And we're going to see examples tomorrow, I can assure you. <laughs> um, Barbara, did you have a question? Thank you. Um, I'd like 
Jürgen? Yeah. Uh, I'd like to ask Huda, if you please, if you could tell us um, sort of technically what happens between somebody thinking about making a variation on a digital font and one appearing on one's computer. What, what how do you get from the one to the other? Um, you mean the process of how it gets on your yes, computer? But, no, what uh, happens before? No, I mean, does the inventing person first of all sit down with a pen? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd like okay. to know the... The actual know, process. The process. Yeah, um, I think different designers have slightly variations on their process, but um, from working with different designers myself, it always starts with... Uh, sketching an idea, like we we draw anything. So it, sometimes the the start is a, is a commission by a client that says, "I have this logo, like a Coca Cola, and make me something that matches with it." You have uh, another starting point where it's actually a person who's interested in a specific script, so they come across a manuscript or an image, and they are inspired by that, or even sometimes a foreign script altogether, not not the same writing. And then then the process starts by actually drawing a few characters, and I think different designers have, it's not as, in, in Latin it's a bit more rigid what letters you start with, in Arabic it's a small variations, but you try to pick a few letters that will have forms that will repeat many times in other letters, and that's... But how does it, how does it get from there? And then, okay, so, it's a, so it goes the process, so you draw, you, you draw the letters, and you draw a few shapes, and then you go straight into the computer, and you draw it on the computer. And you have so the very software, is the, the one I, I use is Glyphs, it's called Glyphs. So you draw the letter forms, you draw the shapes, the outside shapes, you draw them into parts, and then you kind of make collab, you know, collages of different bits and pieces. Yeah, but on with a mouse actually with a mouse on on the mouse or some people draw with a pen on a on a pad on a Wacom pad, and then so you have a drawing in front of you. But the drawing is different because you don't draw like you write. You actually draw outlines, which is different than when you write. You write you write skeletal things, but when you draw outlines, you only you only like put points. Actually, it's almost not even drawing. It's really putting points and then making sure the curves are adjusted so you get a certain curve that is right. Um, and then once you've done that, I mean, from that point, it's really pretty simple. Once you've done the drawing, it's done. You, you export it, and it's done, and you can write with it. I mean, or design, or draw. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Uh, first of all, I, I love the, uh, all the presentations. The lectures were really wonderful. You've done such wonderful work. So. Um, I really appreciate all that. Um, my question is for Dr. Dana. Uh, the, uh, this chart that you showed was wonderful, but I didn't see the, um, a line for Ibn Iyas. Was that for some reason, or there was, was it no on? room. <laughs> there was no room. <laughs> yeah. so if okay. Like two, I, I okay. three more, <laughs> there was no room. Just okay. to know, yeah. uh, the other question I wanted to ask was, um, was there any, what, the example that you gave about the barber, was it uh, um, a singular example or is it uh, part of a tradition? The other, my, my coming question is, was there a competition between written stories and storytellers, the Hakawati tradition? Was there any kind of uh, competition between them, do you think? I don't have any external evidence. All my evidence is from the text itself. So that's my problem, is that I can conjecture as much as I want, and I could be wrong. I think that a lot of these were actually performed publicly, and that they were, and especially the barber's text, you can totally feel, I mean, there's a whole chapter of my book that kind of tries to show how it was actually, um, you know, completely hybrid form between the scholarly and the Sira Shabiya being very, or, or Sira not Shabiya, now we call it Shabiya, the Sira as a part of, uh, of the texture of the text. And then this text was edited in the 19th century and, was, and all these aspects of the Sira were removed out of it. So the comparison between the, the, the 18th century version and the 19th century version just brings out how strongly the Sira was in the text. And plus his being a barber, and his, his master barber was the brother of the Hakawi who died. 
So we're talking about two familiar, you know, there's a familiar relationship between these people. And so you feel that the, the movement between the scholarly and the oral is just very, or oral, the, you know, kind of the primary oral, is very easy. And so sir, it's, I don't want to call it a competition. Maybe it's a symbiosis or, you know, so I wouldn't call it a competition, but I do have a feeling that these may have been performed as I alluded um, in the kind of coffee house uh, scenes. Yeah, well, actually the, the uh, thank you. Uh, yeah. Because th when, you were, uh, when you were giving the lecture, I was visual uh, imagining, um, you know, at uh, the barber uh, at Babel Barit uh -huh. is, giving his story or writing his story and relating it, uh, reading it, I mean. And then at the other end is uh, you have the, uh, the Hakawati at Naufara <laughs> is sitting, you know, and, he's, and he has all this, all his, uh, they, all his followers there. And, uh, <laughs> I think they took who would her. have more people? But, yeah. but, the, but, the, but the Chronicle has such a dramatic pitch yeah. in the narration that, you know, it's just totally, you uh, know, um, as you sit yeah, and, sure. uh, and listen to it. Sure. And it's definitely very oral and... Um, Thank you very much. Thank you. And we have one more. It's on? OK, I have a question for Ludwig. Um, I was very interested, needless to say, in inscriptions. And I wondered if you had found a relationship between the origin of the people the, from the Nispa and the style of the script in which it was written in this foreign place. Were they all local, local East Asian, or was there some sense of trying to recreate your homeland in the inscription? The inscriptions. Mm -hmm. Well, the inscriptions reflect what they live, how they live, and uh, it was a process. Everything was a process. Uh, what's interesting is that they started to use the system, epigraphic system from the center in the 30s, 40th centuries, until the middle of the 15th, and then it disappears. It disappears because uh, these uh, roads were cut by the uh, discovery of uh, the way around the Africa and uh, the arrival of Europeans. And uh, so the contact with uh, the Arabic language was stopped. And uh, well, I wanted to speak about it, but uh, I was looking at home, uh, at home, at home before the time. Uh, at around uh, uh, 1550, uh, start a, a huge quantity of tombstones with just strokes. It's even not alifa, it's just strokes because the Arabic language disappeared. And the local people who uh, started to use again uh, their language, uh, they forgot, uh, they didn't know how to write Arabic. Uh. So they're evolving and Arabic. So uh, until uh, well, they were, uh, in Indonesia, they don't uh, write Arabic, for example. Uh, so uh, it disappeared completely. This, this reminds me of the um, uh, designers who use this nonsense lorry ipsum text, which is supposed to look like, like some language, but it doesn't mean anything. So anyway, I think we should stop there um, for today. Um, I invite you all to come back tomorrow morning. Um, eight, doors open at 8.30. Yeah, start at 9. We start at 9 as we do today. Um, and that's an American 9, not a, yes. Um, and um, that for the speakers and fellows, we are to um, uh, gather t um, at, uh, for a walking tour of the um, uh, exhibition. Um, and anything else I need to m mention? Okay. So speakers and fellows gather up and a round of applause for a wonderful first day. <laughs>